Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Chinese man arrested for blasphemy in Pakistan could face death penalty. Pakistan's bleed India with a thousand cuts doctrine at work. And Afghan women bear the brunt of Taliban diktats. The arrest of a Chinese national in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan has again brought Pakistan's draconian blasphemy laws under global attention. The Chinese engineer arrested on alleged accusations of disrespecting Allah in front of workers at Dasu Hydropower Project could face death penalty under Pakistani laws. If not under Pakistan's infamous blasphemy laws, the Chinese man could even become victim of mob lynching like many other past cases. We have a report. Islamic nation Pakistan and its barbaric blasphemy laws have yet again arrived to gain global ire. A Chinese national was recently victimized under Pakistan's blasphemy laws in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province when he allegedly made some remarks against Allah. The Chinese national identified as Mr. Tian was described by the local police as a transportation supervisor at Dasu Hydropower project. The Chinese supervisor was allegedly dissatisfied with the slow pace of work during Ramadan season that led to a heated argument between the Chinese supervisor and the Muslim workers. Soon he was circled by the mob of Muslim workers and later arrested by the police on charges of blasphemy. Under Pakistan's blasphemy laws, a conviction on such accusations could bring the death penalty. This Chinese engineer was uh, uh, accusing the workers and Dasu Hydro Power project for being lazy due to Ramadan. And there was an argument which escalated and uh, allegedly he said something uh, against the, the maybe Ramadan or Allah which then instigated this uh, this riot kind of thing and they wanted to lynch him alive. The incident of a Chinese national accused of making remarks against Islam in Kohistan in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is one among the thousands of cases charged under blasphemy in Pakistan. In August 2021, an eight-year-old Hindu boy was charged under the draconian law and nearly escaped death penalty. In the same year, a Sri Lankan national in the city of Sialkot was beaten to death over allegations of blasphemy. In 2019, Nutanlal, a teacher from Hindu minority in Sindh province, was later sentenced to life imprisonment. It is appalling that several minorities were targeted and killed on mere suspicion of blasphemy by the mob itself before Pakistan's law could take its course. A blasphemy law is that in Pakistan, General Muhammad Zayal Haq has added 295C in karke to isko ek has made a crime that the death of the death of the death of the death of the کہ شاتم رسول کی سزا سر تن سے جدا اور ایک فنیٹک جو ہے وہ سوسائٹی پیدا کی گئی جس کا یہ شاخصانہ ہے بلیس فیمی لاؤ کو ہمیشہ استعمال کیا گیا ہے جو مذہبی اقلیتیں ہیں ریلیجیس مائنورٹیز ہیں ان میں خوف پیدا کرنے کے لیے ان کو دبانے کے لیے ان کو ڈرانے کے لیے پولیٹیکل اوپننٹس کو خوف زدہ کرنے کے لیے پولیٹیکل ٹریڈ یونینسٹ کو خوف زدہ کرنے کے لیے ہیومن رائٹ ایکٹیوسٹ کو دبانے کے لیے اور ان کو خوف زدہ رکھنے کے لیے انٹروڈیوسڈ ان 1986 ڈیتھ پینلٹی فور سچ کرائمز انڈر پاکستانس لا ہیڈ گیون اے سب کانشیس بوسٹ ٹو ریلیجیس ایکسٹریمسٹ اینڈ ٹیرسٹ اے سیف ریفیوج دی آؤٹ برسٹ آف اسلامک ریلیجیس ایکسٹریمزم کڈ بی سین ورلڈ اوور Take the recent incident of foil terror attack on Jews in Chabar House in Greece by some Pakistani terrorists or killings of Hindu and other minorities in Pakistan over the past years. Pakistan has undoubtedly fostered terrorism 
veiled under Islamic religiosity. The occurrence of latest case of blasphemy where a Chinese national has become a victim would somehow dent the relationship between China and Pakistan. For now, China is verifying the situation regarding the case. However, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin has said, the Chinese government has always required overseas Chinese citizens to abide by the laws and regulations of the host country and respect local customs. If this issue does involve a Chinese citizen, the embassy will provide consular protection and assistance within the scope of its duties. Human rights organizations have long fought against Pakistan's blasphemy laws, despite the fact that the number of accusations and convictions has not diminished under successive administrations. Whatever you are seeing in media that there is Khalistan movement going on outside India, in America, in Canada, is all hyped up. There are more than a million Sikhs who live in North America and out of that, only 50 show up outside Indian embassy to protest. Join us as we discuss why Pakistan, a country on the cusp of failure on all fronts, is relentless in its conspiracies and attacks against India and why, despite their best nefarious efforts, is bound to fail again and again. In a tremendous show of solidarity, hundreds of people gathered in different cities around the world chanting pro-India slogans. They also called out Pakistan's insidious plans of exploiting gullible Sikh youths under the pretext of Khalistan to further its agenda of labeling India with the tag that Pakistan itself is oft accused of, a state against minorities. These events were organized at the heels of the unrestrained display of hooliganism by paid Khalistani thugs who attacked several Indian missions in different cities of Europe and the United States of America. Whatever you're seeing in media that there's a Khalistan uh, movement going on outside in India, in America, in Canada, this is all hyped up. There's more than a million Sikhs who live uh, in North America. And out of that, only 50 show up outside Indian Embassy to protest. And if you combine them, they're not more than 250 people. And this is like jeopardizing the whole Sikh community in India and in outside India, who love India and who support India and who love Punjab. In what appeared to be the well-coordinated execution of a nefarious plan, a trained Khalistani Amritpal Singh, descended on Indian soil last September, allegedly after his successful indoctrination by Pakistan's inter-services intelligence in the later tenure of his over a decade-long stint in Dubai. The self-styled preacher and leader of Waris Punjab Day, a secessionist group, quickly ascended the infamy ladder thanks to his proclivity for rabble-rousing and his anti-India speeches. He can speak to social media. He's very pleasant on TV or cameras. And uh, this really sells. So you look at his initial popularity, it was all on Clubhouse, right? He was coming on Clubhouse, he was making these points. He was very articulate in Punjabi. He could understand the nuance and the jargon, the sort of new political jargon that uh, decolonialization, you know, uh, 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 privilege, uh, even woke talk. Uh, he understood that. Currently, Amrapal Singh is at large. Amrapal has been in hiding since Indian agencies launched an operation to arrest him, following his purported role in anti-India activities. Indian agencies have already arrested dozens of his aides, associates, and financiers. This turned out to be a major setback for the ambitions of Khalistani operators, who are based out of Pakistan, as their plans were nipped in the bud their concepts, ideas, and agendas failed to resonate with the masses in Punjab. The Indian state has never treated Sikhs as second to anyone. Irrespective of hues and ideologies of different governments, 
Sikhs have enjoyed all the benefits accorded to a minority as enshrined in the Indian constitution. The Sikh-dominated state of Punjab has remained one of the most prosperous states of the country for the majority of India's 70-year history as an independent nation. One must be incredibly ignorant to peddle or believe the narrative that Sikhs have been marginalized in India or have not received what they deserve. Taliban rule has had a devastating impact on Afghan women and girls. Afghan women and girls are facing both the collapse of their rights and dreams and risks of their basic survival. Taliban are dictating what women must wear, how they should travel, workplace segregation and even what kind of cell phones women should have. They enforce these rules through intimidation and inspections. Recently, Afghan authorities are closing education centers and institutes supported by non-governmental groups in South. A report. When the Taliban took back control of the country, there was brief hope they would allow more freedoms for women compared to their brutal Austria rule of the 1990s. But ever since they seized power in Afghanistan, the group has been clamping down women's rights by barring them access to education and public spaces. In the latest, Afghan authorities are closing education centers and institutes supported by non-governmental groups in the South. The centers are mostly for girls who are banned from going to school beyond sixth grade. The education ministry ordered the Taliban heartland provinces of Helmand and Kandhar to close education centers and institutes while a committee reviews their activities. It did not provide an explanation for the closures and a ministry spokesman was not immediately available for comment. The Afghan government's diktat to deny their women the right to education is absolutely absurd and shocking. It yet again reeks of the narrow mindset that the Taliban government has and the reasons given for denying the women the basic right of education is irrational and illogical. It is high time that the Taliban government realizes that subduing the aims and aspirations of its women will not lead the nation anywhere and will cause more discord and discontentment in their nation. This incident comes just days after the Taliban banned Afghan women employees of the United Nations from working throughout the country. In response to the decision, the United Nations asked some 3,000 staff men and women to stay at home until May 5, while it made necessary consultations, made any required adjustments to its operations and accelerated contingency planning. The United Nations has said that it is ready to take the heartbreaking decision to pull out of Afghanistan in May if it can't persuade the Taliban to let local women work for the organization. Any negative consequences on this crisis for the Afghan people will be the responsibility of the de facto authorities. Um, and just to confirm that we will maintain principled and constructive engagement with all possible levels of the Taliban de facto authorities as mandated by the Security Council. The Taliban regime has failed to earn recognition from any UN member state because of their rigid and intransigent mode of governance, their inability to transform their mindset on issues such as women's freedom. Taliban government should understand that a country can't survive in the 21st century by pursuing a retrogressive and ultra-conservative approach. The eventual outcome of suppressing the freedom and creativity of women will be the erosion of Afghan society. Banning women's movements, curtailing all their freedom, health and education will augment frustration and anger among the Afghan women. In turn, the wrong message will be delivered to the world that the Afghan people are socially backward and can never live a normal life.
Women in Afghanistan have been facing numerous challenges since the Taliban returned to power in 2021. Girls and women in the war-torn country have no access to education, employment and public spaces. Despite all odds, the spirit of Afghan women remains high and they are trying to push on, proving to be a shining example of self-reliance. Have a look. Women in Afghanistan have been facing numerous challenges since the Taliban returned to power in 2021. Girls and women in the war-torn country have no access to education, employment, and public spaces. Despite all odds, the spirit of Afghan women remains high and they are trying to push on, proving to be a shining example of self-reliance. Many, like 22-year-old Sophia, logs in for an online English course run by one of a growing number of educational institutes. These institutes are trying to reach Afghanistan's girls and women who have been prevented from going to school due to the Taliban administration's restrictions. Actually, in that situation, uh, that we are banning from going to school, university or any type of courses, this is a good opportunity for girls, for women in Afghanistan to continue their education. Uh, their studies as, uh, in online courses, so this is why I want to continue my studies in online courses and uh, this is my dream, this is my goal to finish my studying whatever what happened in Afghanistan. Girls and women desperate to get an education have since flooded online schools like Sophia's online school, Rumi Academy, with applications. The school says it has seen its enrollment of mostly women rise from about 50 students to more than 500 after the Taliban took over. But like anyone else in Afghanistan who uses the internet, online students are hampered by power cuts and cripplingly slow internet speeds. <laughs> Afghan women are also trying to be self-reliant by engaging themselves in business activities. They virtually joined an exhibition in Dubai to promote their carpets, jewelry, dried fruit, and other handmade goods as part of a push to access international markets. The three-day exhibition, supported by the United Nations Development Program, included 26 Afghan female-run businesses. Due to the difficulty of getting a visa and travel restrictions, the business owners joined via video link from Kabul. شرایط بعدی که کابل سقوط کرد افغانستان سقوط کرد ما خیلی ناامید شده بودیم که شاید افغانستان برگشت به 20 سال قبل اما خانم های افغانستان خیلی مبارز هستند مبارزه میکنن مبارزین اقتصادی هستیم ما ما اجازه نمیتیم به هیچ عنوان که ما کاربار خود از دست بتیم یا بر حکومت واجی شویم نه خیر ما همیشه مبارزه کردیم و هنوز هم مبارزه میکنیم facing a decades long conflict Afghanistan grapples with numerous challenges, including a food shortage, as foreign governments are cutting development funding and imposing sanctions, in large part due to the Taliban's restrictions on women. The World Food Program is currently short of 93 million USD, causing it to reduce rations to 4 million Afghans to 50% of what they need. Another 9 million people will lose access to food aid entirely in April, if it does not receive funding commitments in coming weeks. Amid all confrontations, the Afghans have not relinquished their spirit and they are hopeful for better days ahead. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.